Philippians chapter 1, again returning to a series that we began earlier this year called uh, Letters from Lockdown. So let's just begin with some background on the book of Philippians. Uh, for those of you perhaps who've never read it, or perhaps you haven't read it in a while. Uh, so the church in Philippi, which is who Paul wrote the letter to, is believed to be the first European church plant by Paul. Uh, in fact, Philippi is where we find the very first Gentile convert to Christianity, a lady by the name of Lydia. I'm sure, there are a couple of you in this room that have very famous names. Uh, so Lydia led the way in the Gentiles uh, coming to know Christ throughout the uh, non-Jewish world. And so most commentators agree that Paul wrote the letter to Philippians while he was in prison in Rome between the years 61 to 63 AD and probably closer to 63 AD, which would have been toward the end of his imprisonment in Rome. Um, Philippians is considered to be the most personal and encouraging of Paul's letters with joy being its chief theme. In fact, 16 times the noun or verb joy is used, which is quite remarkable considering the fact that when Paul wrote Philippians, he was on death row. Very interesting. So for example, in Philippians 1, 19, Paul said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or or by death. Paul speaks in Philippians of, his, of an impending death, and yet the, the, the uh, theme of Philippians is joy. Okay. Um, so, uh, something else to consider about Philippi, uh, if we're going to understand it. So, Philippi was a Roman colony, and so for this reason, polytheism would have uh, ruled the day. So, what is polytheism? Polytheism is the belief in many gods. And so, um, something interesting you can consider about polytheistic nations is that, is that polytheistic nations appear very tolerant of religion and religious beliefs. So, like, if you wanted to move to Philippi uh, in that day and introduce the god of dandelions as uh, the next deity to worship, like, no one would have a problem with that. Uh, no one would be offended. You could preach the gospel of dandelions all throughout Philippi if you wanted to, and no one would stop you. Polytheistic nations uh, would never uh, are, are very tolerant of religion and religious beliefs, with one special exception, though. Okay? Polytheistic nations would never tolerate anyone who preached against the worship of some of the established gods. And so, you know, add, add gods to the list, that's fine. Uh, change the worship practices of the gods that we already have, that's fine too. But do not speak against the worship of gods, because that was a no-no. And so when Paul brought the gospel uh, of Christ to Philippi, uh, it was a very traumatic visit uh, for him. And the reason is because Paul and Silas were beaten with rods uh, and thrown in jail. How's that for your first experience in a new city? Uh, and, and, and the reason they were beaten in rods and thrown in jail was because in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul was dethroning all other gods and putting Jesus alone on the throne, and that is unacceptable in a polytheistic nation. Okay? Jesus could certainly have been added to the list of gods already worshipped in, in, in Philippi, and no one would have blinked an eye. But Paul preached a faith that said Jesus Christ will not be worshipped alongside any other God because there is in truth no other God besides him and that, and that does not fly in a, not, in a, in a polytheistic nation. Okay? So, uh, so think about this. <clears throat> um, in this way, America is a polytheistic nation of sorts. So think about it. Okay? You know, no secular person in America... Uh, cares very much what God you worship, okay? Um, you know, so it, it, nobody really cares what God you worship, just as long as you don't say there's anything wrong with the God someone else worships, right? That's kind of what we believe. And, and that sounds good. 
and it sounds right, and it sounds very tolerant, and it sounds like a standard that we should uphold. But the truth is that uh, none of us are tolerant all the way down. We may say that uh, every religious belief should be tolerated, but what we really mean is this. We really mean every religious belief that does not go against my religious belief <laughs> should be tolerated. All the rest can take a hike, right? And so, as an example, you know, every person who has a coexist bumper sticker on their car does not believe all religions should coexist. What they really mean is that every religious belief that also believes that all religious beliefs should coexist, should coexist. The ones that do not believe that do not deserve to be on the back of my car. I mean, that's what they mean, okay? And so here lies, here lies the moral difficulty uh, of all of humanity. If you're, and that is it. If you're going to believe that anything is actually wrong in life, which all of us believe there's, some things are wrong, if you're going to believe that anything is actually wrong, then you cannot be completely tolerant. You can only be completely tolerant if you're willing to say nothing is absolutely wrong and nothing is absolutely right. So for example, if you believe murder is absolutely wrong all the time, then you are not completely tolerant. Because what if the person who believes that murder is not always wrong? If you really wanted to be completely tolerant, you would say, my belief is that murder is always wrong, but it's okay if someone else does not believe that. You would never say that, right? Uh, and so, if, if we really want to be completely tolerant, <clears throat> well, let's say this again. If you believe that terroristic acts are always wrong, then you're not completely tolerant. Because what of the person who does not believe that terroristic acts are always wrong? Do we tolerate them too? And so the only way to be completely tolerant in this life is to believe that nothing is always wrong and nothing is always right and there is not a person in the world alive who believes this. In fact, we might could narrow down our present secular morality in America to say this. The only thing that is always wrong in America is to say that another person's belief is wrong. But you see, in making that very statement, we have done that which we said is wrong to do. <laughs> we have told the person who does not have that belief that they're wrong. Okay? So in uh, polytheistic nations, which America has some ingredients of, okay, uh, there is a veneer of tolerance. But as Paul found out rather harshly, that tolerance is incomplete. Okay? And so... I say all that to say this, so that when, when Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, to the Philippian church, he wrote them knowing that this was their context. Okay? Paul was beaten and thrown in jail in Philippi because, the Philipp because although the Philippians probably prided themselves in being tolerant, the truth was they were not tolerant all the way down, and neither are we. And so the dilemma of every human person uh, that everyone has to wrestle through uh, at some point in their lives, is to find a belief system that gives reason for our strong beliefs of right or wrong. So, uh, you know, because if you're only grounding for believing that some things are right and some things are wrong, is that some things hurt people and some things don't, then you must first come up with a good reason why it's wrong to hurt people. Like, who said it's wrong to hurt people? I mean, Darwinism tells us that it's right to hurt them. It's how you got here. <laughs> the strong ate the weak, and you happen to be a strong one. So, so this is the polytheistic context of Philippi into which Paul writes this letter, and it's going to inform, or really has to inform, uh, what, how we understand Philipp, uh, Philippians, um, if we're really going to understand what Paul meant. And so, so three things, that's a micro actually, uh, three things I want us to see from this passage today. I want us to see uh, the deep connection of gospel suffering, verses 3 through 7, the role of knowledge in abounding love, 9 through 11, and then the hope in Christian suffering, 12 through 14. So let's talk about the deep connection of gospel suffering. Uh, so the Philippians were in a very difficult uh, kind of rock and hard place. They were in, so they were in a sense, they were too religious 
for their Roman neighbors who said, you can, have, you can have your little gods if you like, but just as long as you don't preach against ours. So they were kind of too religious for the Romans. But on the other hand, they weren't religious enough for these other people called the Judaizers who complained that they were not keeping the sacrifices and obeying the Mosaic law. So the rock in a hard place. In one place I'm not religious enough, in another place I'm too religious. You know, so, so what do you do? Um, you see, in Paul's day, um, there was no prison system of three hots and a cock. So, uh, if you were in prison in those days, there were no cooks to make your meals. There were no heated cells, no flushing toilets. They did not have clean tile floors or coffee three times a day. Okay? Uh, if you were in prison in those days, and you wanted to survive, you depended on your friends and family to bring you food and clothing and anything else in necessity. And so one of the reasons Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians was to thank them for taking care of him in his prison term. So Philippians 4, uh, verse 13, Paul wrote, I can do all uh, things through him who gives me strength, yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of our acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, when I left Philippi, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. So what I desire is, is, is that, uh, that uh, more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Okay. So throughout the book of Philippians, Paul voices an overwhelming affection for the Christians at Philippi because they had shared in his struggles and, they had, and, and, and he had shared in their struggles. And I think you would agree that uh, if ever you have suffered with someone in a mutual battle of difficulty and come out on the other side of that battle together, I, I think you'd agree that there is probably or probably developed a love and affection uh, for one another that probably could not have developed to the depth that it did outside of that suffering. So as many of you know, Marcy and I spent 10 years in New Jersey prior to moving back to New Hampshire. And our first few years in New Jersey were years of struggle for us and for our church planting team. So we moved to New Jersey with three other couples and it was a struggle uh, for all of us. We had no family there, none of us. Uh, no friends outside of ourselves. We were in a new place with strange looking people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we all had new jobs, new homes, new neighborhoods, new schedules. Marcy and I, at the time, had a new child, Michaela. Okay. There, there were no older members of the church to learn under. No one liked Sharon and Al to uh, you know, have dinner with and cry. Uh, and so, uh, for some of us, like Marcy and I, we, we, at the time, we were even alone in our family in the conviction that what we were doing was a good idea. Uh, and we thought we were stepping out in faith to serve Christ, while others in our family thought we were extremely selfish by leaving family. Okay? And so, but here's what happened over time. Because we were all struggling together in our mutual gospel calling to plant a church, to start a church, an affection was gained between one another that I believe could not have been gained any other way. And so we became such close, intimate friends over the first few years, not because, you know, we all experienced the bliss of mar margaritas on the Jersey Shore. <laughs> no. But because we suffered together. Okay? And so one couple, I remember, signed uh, their, the title to their second car over to Marcy and I when our car broke down. Uh, Marcy and I gifted $1,000 per month for six months to that same couple when they fell into hard times, okay? We babysat each other's kids. We experienced rejection together. We had difficult conversations of frustration and hurt, but we never left those conversations unresolved. And I believe there's probably not been a time in all of our lives 
more difficult in our first few years in New Jersey, but the fruit of that prolonged and mutual struggle is four couples who now vacation together every year and whose kids are the best of friends. Okay? In fact, I know that if ever Marcy and I fell into hard times, whatever that may be, each of those couples would do whatever was in their power to shoulder that pain with us, even if it meant bringing suffering upon themselves. Okay? And so what Paul voices in the first few verses of this letter is his overwhelming affection for the Philippian Christians because of their partnership or their mutual suffering in Christ. He said in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you in all of my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Uh, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you since, since I have you in my heart and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. So, And so... This is, I think, so encouraging for us today. Because what this means is that mutual suffering, suffering together, is not something to be feared by the Christian. Um, rather, mutual suffering is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for a deeper affection with Christ, and it's an opportunity for a deeper affection for one another. When we suffer together as Christians, there is an affection and a love that is possible that would not be possible apart from that struggle. But in particular, when we suffer together because of our mutual faith in Christ, true Christian love and affection grows. So for example, when I know that you depart from our worship gathering every Sunday and courageously put your faith into action in workplaces that are hostile to your faith, and you know that I'm doing the same thing, that mutual suffering unites us. We say, hey, we're brothers. I know what we're struggling. We're doing this together, okay? And so now on the flip side, if I... <laughs> If I know you are suffering, not because of your faith, but because of your foolish, sinful choices, that does not automatically unite us, right? That might actually divide us, okay? But mutual suffering, because we serve Christ together in hostile environments, that's bonding, okay? And so what I suspect will happen over time is that those who are on the front end of Water's Edge, helping her launch and get started they will have a mutual affection for one another because that journey brought us into mutual suffering. Okay? We, we, uh, we did difficult work together. We made difficult decisions together. We experienced difficult Sundays together in which we wondered if this thing would ever fly. <laughs> do you guys remember the Sunday where we didn't have music? I do! <laughs> that was awkward. All right? Uh, so, you know, hey, I, I suspect that my Celebrate Recovery team and I will develop a mutual affection for one another over the years because we have suffered together in bringing Christ to those in addiction. We made hard decisions together. We had difficult conversations together. We had a troubling circumstances that we had to navigate together. We even had negative newspaper articles written about us that kind of prejudiced some people against us, and we're only three years into it. <laughs> Okay, so folks, mutual suffering for the Christian is one of the greatest opportunities we have to grow in our love and affection for Christ, but also in our love and affection for one another. And so this is why, this is why solo Christianity is unheard of in the Bible. Like you can't be a Christian all by yourself. If you're a Christian all by yourself, which means that you are not a part of a church, whether that be a church that meets in a building or a church that meets at home, a house church, whatever. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are a Christian all by yourself, this means you suffer all by yourself too. And isolated suffering, different than mutual suffering, does not lead to increased love and affection for God and others. In fact, it's the opposite. 
If you are suffering alone for your faith, uh, you will likely feel abandoned by God, nobody's with me, and, and, and by God's people, and as a result, you will probably regress in your faith and not progress in your faith. Does that make sense? And so, uh, the sort of bonding Paul prays for is a bond which develops through mutual suffering, not because of the absence of suffering. Okay? So that's, I think, the first thing we see in this passage, is the deep connection of gospel suffering. When we experience mutual suffering together as Christians, there is an affection possible for one another that is not possible any other way. Uh, but, but again, that, that mutual suffering cannot happen in isolation. The second thing we see is the role of knowledge in abounding love. The role of knowledge in abounding love. So in, in monistic religions, and I'll explain what that is, in monistic religions, human uh, experience can be understood with a circle. Okay. Here's a picture of monism. Uh, and so, uh, in, in monistic religions, which would include um, Buddhism, which would include uh, Hinduism, which would also include atheism, okay, uh, monism... <clears throat> Uh, describes all of uh, existence with this circle. So inside this circle uh, is nature and people and animals and stars and chemicals and nations and religions. In monistic thought, everything that has ever existed or that exists now uh, can fit within this circle. Now, uh, monism, different than monotheism, is the belief that everything is one. It's the belief in a total unity that is the ground of everything. So if you were to imagine yourself in monistic thought as a part of the circle, here's what you would see. You would see yourself as well as everyone else and everything else as part of the circle. Nothing exists outside of that circle. Does that make sense? Okay. So... And uh, so in Zen Buddhism, for example, the way you teach about this oneness to children is with a drop of water. And so here's how it goes. The drop of water is lonely. The drop of water worries about evaporation. Okay? It is frustrated because the function of water is for fish to swim in it, but the drop of water is too small for fish to swim in. And so the solution to this problem, the solution to all of the world's problems, is to go back to the ocean and become one with the all. Okay? And so when you become one with the all, this is what happens. You dissolve into the all's oneness. Okay? And so the ideal state of things in monistic thought is a complete Oneness, such that when our time is over, we'll become one with the all again. And so in atheism, this happens when we die and become fertilizer, one with the all, which is just matter. Or in Zen Buddhism, we reach a place of enlightenment where you become one with everything else. So why do I say this? Because when people in monistic religions pray and meditate, they are not doing what the Christian is doing. So meditation and prayer for, for the monist is not about talking to God. It's about becoming one with your surroundings. Uh, in, in monistic prayer, you are not trying to get rid... Uh, you, uh, in monistic prayer, you're trying to get rid of all your thoughts. You're not trying to think. And so you're trying to go numb and blank... You are trying to get rid of the illusion that you are a person and simply become one with your surroundings. And so literally, what you are trying to do when you meditate as a Buddhist, you are, um, you are trying to get rid of all thoughts such that you feel you are the wood, you are the wall, you are the air, you are the sound around you. And so prayer or meditation for the monist will often involve humming or chanting. And the reason for this is because 
a repetitive humming or chanting puts a vibration on your lips, which gives you the illusion that you're one with everything. So try that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a vibration there, and you begin to feel one with everything around you. That's what monistic prayer and meditation is all about. Um, and so think, think about this. Uh, this is how many people today who know nothing about monistic religions, this is how many people deal with life today. They deal with it at a, as a monist would through mindlessness and numbness. They are constantly trying to stop thinking. They, are, they, they stay busy to stop thinking. They try to numb their mind with substances. They try to escape into virtual worlds as if to dissolve from this world into an imaginary world somewhere else, right? People are constantly trying to deal with life the way a monist deals with life. But the monist uh, viewpoint has some strong handicaps. Number one, in monistic thought, your individuality as a person is just an illusion. And so the atheist would say, you just think you are a person, but you are in reality just matter, and will be just matter one day like everything else. Or for the Buddhist, you would say, you are not an individual personality, you are one with the all, and the idea that you are an individual is part of your problem. So in monistic thoughts, you're not an individual. You're not, the fact that you think you are is the illusion that you need to escape from because you really need to be one with the all. But secondly, since everything in existence is really just one, okay, that means that good and evil are one as well. And so if everything that exists exists within this circle, then evil is in here too. And what that means is that ultimately you must become one with evil or try to come up with some reason why evil does not actually exist. Does that make sense? So... Many people today deal with life as a monist deals with life. They try to deaden their thinking in various ways. They try to numb their minds and disappear and dissolve, right? In fact, you've probably witnessed uh, how certain dosages of medication for some people almost take away their personality and make them emotionally and mentally numb. You kind of witnessed that where they, they're there but they're not there, Right? And so, but here's where Christianity is uh, wildly, and again, I'm not speaking against medication. So certain dosages do that to us. Here's where Christianity is, is wildly different and wildly more hopeful. In uh, verse 9, Paul says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. What Paul prays for them in his Roman dungeon is not that they may lose all of their thoughts and become one with their surroundings. Rather, Paul prays that they may think more deeply. Okay? He prays that they may abound still more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Paul prayed that they may fill their minds, not empty their minds. Paul prayed that they would go deep in reflection, not numb in mindlessness. Christian growth in this way is not about emptying our minds and coming to a state of oneness where we don't feel or think anymore. Christian growth is about filling our minds increasingly with our understanding of Christ and letting our feelings flow from that knowledge. Okay? So think about it. God did not give us a mind so that we could figure out how to turn it off through humming and chanting. That's not why he gave it. Okay? God gave us a mind so that we could contemplate heavenly things. Okay? Therefore, if you struggle with anxiety or depression, God's answer for you is not that you stop thinking. Ah, when I, when, when I think about this, I get depressed, so I just need to stop thinking. I need to drink, and I need to numb my mind, and I have racing thoughts, so I need to pop a pill and stop them. Okay. Folks, those things may temporarily relieve the pain of racing thoughts, but they are not a solution. The solution to 
Uh, depression and anxiety is not in the cessation of thought. Rather, the solution is learning to think more deeply. The solution is in God bringing your mind to new levels of thought and reflection on Him. And this is not to say that, you know, if you just read your Bible more, all of that will go away. But, but here's what it is saying. It's to say that your anxiety and depression begin with your thoughts. And the solution is not for you to stop thinking. But that your thinking and your understanding be transformed and lifted and, and elevated to a place that God, uh, a place where God is. And so Paul's prayer for them is that their love may abound more and more as their knowledge and understanding of Christ grows. Our love for one another, folks, will flow out of a growing knowledge of Jesus Christ and not through mindlessness. And so I think that part of what we gain when we are together on Sundays is we gain a new depth of insight into God's Word, which we need if we are going to love each other and the world increasingly. And so I see it as my role to, to help us see more deeply into God's Word because we cannot grow in Christ unless we do. Christians, I believe, ought to be the deepest thinkers you know. Because they are trying to think. <laughs> They're not trying to shut their minds off. Right? That's not why God gave us a mind. So we see first the, uh, the deep connection of gospel suffering. We see the role of knowledge in abounding love. Our love will abound more and more as our understanding of God's word grows more and more too. And then thirdly, and we'll close with this. We see the hope in Christian suffering. Just this weekend, I received a call from a local family who lost yet another family member. And that is three deaths in two years for this family. And I've officiated both of the funerals beforehand. And so they asked me if I would do it again. And, and you know, part of me wonders uh, if this family can recover from these three premature deaths. These people were not 80 and 90 years old. They were premature. Okay. And so they were all unexpected. They were all tragic. They were all young. In fact, one death was in part because she could not take the death of the one who died before. Okay. So how do we find hope in these situations? How do we stay positive when repetitive tragedies strike? Well, Paul leads us here. He says in verse 12, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and, uh, and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And then in chapter 2, he would say this, But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul, <laughs> folks, Paul's on death row. <laughs> and he's speaking this. His life is about to end through injustice. And he's thinking about all the good that will come from it. How does he do this? How can he possibly maintain such a joy-filled spirit in the midst of such, such lopsided and bigoted injustice? Folks, Paul's in prison not because of his religious deeds that hurt people. He's in prison because of his religious beliefs. He hasn't done anything to hurt people. But, he, so here's, he's not angry, though, at the system. He's not angry at God. He's not pointing the finger. He's not even hating his captors. Instead, the whole palace guard, he says in verse 13, is learning about Christ through him. Okay? So how do we find hope in these situations? Well, th this is where deep thinking becomes necessary. 
Paul found hope in his unjust situation because he knew of a Savior who unjustly suffered for him. Paul could find hope in his pain because he knew the eternal hope that, that, that became possible through Jesus' pain. Paul knew good would come from his bad, from his bad situation, because he knew of the great good that came from the ugliest situation of all, Calvary. Okay? On the cross, the world thought God lost, but on the cross is where God's Son actually won. Paul's faith could grow through suffering because he knew he served a God who already suffered for him. You know, the God of the Bible is, is not like uh, the gods of polytheism who make their humans, human minions suffer for them. The God of the Bible, folks, this is, this is Christmas. He comes to suffer for us. Paul can accept suffering with joy because he sees in part, he, he sees it as a part of his service to Christ. The Apostle James would say, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because your God faced trials of many kinds for you and overcame them. Okay? Christ suffered for me when he came to earth. Now Paul gets to suffer for Christ and one day leave this earth. Okay? This is how he maintains hope. And this is how we need to maintain hope, too. And so as we prepare to surround communion again, let me ask you, do you understand with your mind the hope that you have in Christ? Do you see that suffering is a way to follow your Savior in His footsteps? Do you see that suffering for Christ is not a punishment, but a privilege for you? Do you see that a pain-free life is not the life Christ lived for you, and therefore you cannot expect to live a pain-free life for him? Okay. Do you see that the road with Christ is a bumpy one? Now it's straight and it's narrow, but it's not flat. Okay. <laughs> Have you failed to rejoice in suffering because you expected God to take away all of your struggle when you became a Christian? God will take all, away all your struggle, but not yet, not now. Okay. Have you failed to find hope in your suffering because you've not thought deep enough about Christ's suffering for you? Have you been pleased that Christ would suffer for you, but not been pleased to suffer for him? Let us be a little more honest and ask, the suffering you are facing right now, are you facing it because of your faith in Christ? Are you facing it as a result of living in a fallen world? Or are you facing that suffering because of your sinful choices? In either case, there is still great hope, but the third of the options will require repentance and prayer and change, and the others will not. Are you willing to experience mutual suffering with other believers, or are, you, or are you bound and determined to go it alone? Now, my guess is if you're here, you're not of that sort. <laughs> you're not here. Uh, what is your next step in your walk with Christ? What do you need to do? What do you need to lay at Jesus' feet and finally confess? What help do you need to finally break free? What will you do today? The deep connection of gospel suffering, the role of knowledge and abounding love, and the hope that's possible in Christian suffering. Would you stand as we read our communion scripture today? <clears throat>